Right. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome back to CS330. Um, today, we'll be talking about lifelong learning. And uh, this lecture will be a little different than the previous lectures we've had. Uh, it will be much more open-ended um, and I think a little more interactive as well. And um, this is because the topic itself is much more open-ended as well. Um, all right, so the plan for today is um, as following. Uh, we'll start with the lifelong learning problem statement and we'll try to see why this on its by itself is quite challenging already. Um, then we'll think of some basic approaches that can allow us to uh, address the problem of lifelong learning. Um, we can, we'll also think about how we can do better than these basic approaches. And then we'll revisit the problem um, by looking at it from the meta learning perspective. All right. Um, so I want to start with a brief review of the problem statements that we have been considering so far um, in the class. And uh, one of them was multitask learning. And the problem start statement was as following. We are given a set of tasks up front. Uh, we can train on these tasks and then we'll be evaluated based on the performance on those exact same tasks. So we are just trying to learn to solve a set of tasks. And then we also talked about the meta learning problem statement. Uh, that is a little bit different. So in this case, we are given an IID task distribution and we are tasked to learn a, a new task efficiently. So we are given a batch of data with many different tasks. And based on that, we need to uh, be able to learn how to learn quickly so that given a new task, we can quickly adjust to it and, and learn how to do it. All right, so these are the problem statements we have been, we have been considering so far. But um, in many real world settings, the the, the setting is actually a little bit different. So rather than having this batch of data or batch of different tasks that we can pre-train on, either in the multitask or meta learning, it would look more or less like this. So we would have tasks that are given to us, but they're not given to us up front right off the bat. Instead, they're coming to us in sequence. So for instance, we need to you know, learn how to walk first and then after we can do this, we will start learning how to run. And after we do this, we are given another task and we kind of uh, keep, keep going and, and keep learning new tasks that come in sequence rather than having this, uh, this big batch of, of data and tasks up front. All right, so a few examples just to um, show you what, what, what I mean by this new problem statement. Um, so for example, a student learning concepts in school as, uh, as an example of, uh, of this real world setting that is more sequential, or rather than being given all the different classes and all the different um, levels of in, in a particular class, you, you're, uh, you're given different concepts in a, a sort of curriculum. So you will first learn how to do algebra one and then you'll do algebra two. You're not given all of those, all of the knowledge at, at once. Another example is a deployed image classification system that is um, trying to learn from a stream of images that come from users. And here, things that can change over time is, are things such as user preferences or the Im images that the users tend to take. The, the preferences and, and the images might change over time and the algorithm should be able to adjust to that. Another, an, another more robotics example is a robot acquiring, acquiring an increasingly large set of skills in different environments. So in this case, we can imagine a robot that is um, initially deployed, let's say, in a, in a kitchen, and it's doing all kinds of different tasks in a kitchen. But after a while, we wanted to also clean the bathroom. Um, so in that case, we would want the robot to be able to quickly transition to that new skill. And as it's given more and more tasks and skills in a sequence, should, every new task should come easier and easier. Another one is a virtual assistant learning to help different users with different tasks at different points in time. Um, so in that case, we would want to have an assistant that can adjust to our preferences over time. We don't want to have an assistant that was just pre-trained on something and it never responds to us and learns from our uh, interactions with it, uh, but it should be something that can uh, kind of quickly adjust to our preferences and understand that better so that the longer we interact with it, the better it gets. And then um, the, the last example uh, uh, we have here is a doctor's assistant aiding in a medical decision making where things that can change over time as um, you know, the, the diseases that uh, the, the doctor's assistant would need to be able to deal with such as COVID-19 that wasn't really around a few years ago. 
Um, so it needs to be able to adjust its decisions over time and hopefully with every new disease or with every new patient, it's able to get better and better. All right, so um, before we uh, jump into a little exercise about the problem statement, I wanted to introduce a little bit of terminology. Um, so overall, we'll be concerned with sequential learning settings and uh, people refer to it with different names. So such as online learning, lifelong learning, continual learning, incremental, incremental learning, and streaming data. Um, often they mean slightly different things. Um, and it's important when you, when you read papers on, on lifelong learning to kind of uh, really understand the problem statement that the authors are trying to solve, because very often, even though they're called the same, the problem statement is slightly different. Uh, but overall, we will assume that all of these terms um, can be Try, try to refer to the same sequential learning setting, the lifelong learning setting, and we'll discuss the problem statement in a second. It's important to note that this is distinct from sequence data or sequential decision making. So an example of sequential data is, for example, um, a corporate text, where um, we might still want to learn a text generator that uh, was trained on a large batch of data. Um, and the data itself is sequential, so you're generating one word after another, um, but it's not really a sequential learning setting in the sense that you're not given new tasks over time. You're still pre-trained on a large set of tasks and data. And then sequential decision-making, we talked about this in the context of, of reinforcement learning. This is a situation where um, we can make decisions um, or we, we have to make sequential decisions uh, but we can still do, the, for example, using reinforcement learning, but we can still do this from an offline data set uh, that we get to pre-train on. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a sequential learning setting where we are given new tasks as we, as we go. There's All a right. question uh, in the chat asking, uh, lifelong learning seems similar to active learning. What are the differences between the two? Yeah, so I think, um, Active learning, some people refer to some aspects of lifelong learning as active learning. So one aspect of, of active learning that, um, or one, one aspect of learning that makes it more active is that we are searching for data that would be particularly useful um, for the algorithm to know about. So for example, an, an interactive system that is trying to query the user for the data that it's most uncertain about. It's an example of an active learning system. Um, I think a lifelong learning system can have this property as well, um, but lifelong assumes that 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 sequential um, that, that, that these tasks there's there's multiple of them, and you kind of as as you get new tasks you shouldn't forget about the old ones, and as you get more tasks you should be getting better and better at the new tasks that you are getting. So there are like slightly different axes of the problem, but I think you can build a lifelong active learning system. Uh, where you do both, where the active learning system can ask for uh, the data that is the most useful to it, and it's, it can also do it over its lifetime. All right, um, cool. So we'll do a little exercise right now. Um, and this is so that uh, we can come up with a lifelong learning problem statement, all right? So the exercise is as following. Um, I'll ask you to pick an example setting and I'll give you the, I'll put on a slide the examples that I just talked about. Um, and then I'll ask you to discuss the problem statement in your breakout room. So we'll split in breakout rooms. And we'll do this in a second. Um, we'll do it such that there's three to four students per room. And um, I would ask you if the first letter of your first name is closer to the beginning of the alphabet. Uh, you'll be the one responsible for taking the notes and then presenting it to the to the rest of the class. Um, so the problem statement, the, the, the questions that I would like you to, to focus on are the following. First, how would you set up an experiment to develop and test your lifelong learning algorithm? And this is very open-ended. So kind of use your creativity and kind of think what, how would you set up an experiment to develop and test the lifelong learning algorithm? Second question is what are the desirable and or required properties of such algorithm? And thirdly, how would you evaluate such a system? All right, so here I'll show you the, uh, this works. One second. 
Okay, here are the example settings that I talked about just uh, uh, a few slides ago. So you're welcome to use any of these if that helps for your discussion, or if you're feeling um, you know, particularly creative, feel free to come up with your own. Uh, this is very encouraged. And uh, we'll do this for five minutes. Um, so I'll try to split you into breakout rooms right now. Uh, and we'll meet in five minutes and we'll have the, the presenters from each group um, tell us what they, what they came up with. All right, so I can split you into the breakout rooms. All right. I think all of you um, should have been invited to join breakout rooms. So please join them and I'll see you in five minutes. Right, so five minutes passed. I will close the rooms now. Oh, they will close in, in one minute. Okay. <laughs> All right, and uh, breakout rooms are all closed. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I hope you get uh, good discussions. Um, so I will be asking uh, for a person from each room to tell us a little bit about um, what they what they've discussed, and I'll I'll try to take notes. So I have my little stylus here. And I hope you can read my handwriting. Um, but uh, I'll take notes and we'll be talking about desirable properties and considerations as well as the evaluation setup. Um, and I just wanted to, um, to uh, let you know that uh, the, the, the problem setting is one of the hardest parts of lifelong learning um, challenge or lifelong learning, the topic of lifelong learning. So uh, this is a really difficult exercise. Um, but with that, let's get started. So um, I'll ask the person from room number one to tell us all about desirable properties and evaluation setup. Uh, sure. Um, this from room one, I believe. Um, so we chose a setting of an image classification system. Uh, okay. So our experiment would be uh, you know, first we decide on like a data set. So we chose uh, the the Agnes data set. Um, and our experiment is we want to sort of build up the knowledge of the classifier being able to distinguish between um, each of like the digits. Um, it's kind of like an incremental. So we begin with the classifier being able to discriminate between the first digit and um, let's say like uh, digit number two. And then uh, we can do like the testing um, to sort of almost do classes. But then in like the next round, we have it discriminate between uh, class one and two and then kind of three and four. And then we um, create like put the test on all of the digits. So we kind of do that incrementally. And then the goal would be to sort of, it can build up 
good knowledge quickly. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you're learning incrementally and you're given, uh, you start with the with digit one and then you're given the next digit over time. And uh, what are the desirable properties of such an algorithm? So you wanted to uh, learn, in, so be learning increasingly, is that what you said? Yes. And uh, so, so what, what are the other properties that you would want it to, to have? Yeah, um, I think the ability to learn what is needed to learn quickly, I guess. So because of the new kind of digits, um, each kind of digit has its own kind of set like of different kinds of characteristics. So I guess maybe being able to learn quickly, kind of like a few shot manner. Okay, so with every new digit, it should learn quicker and quicker. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, and how would you evaluate this algorithm specifically? So you would have, actually, I guess I should have it in the MNIST part here. Yeah. Um, you would have the MNIST digits, and you are um, measuring what exactly? Yeah, so um, I guess this specific metric, um, I guess we would evaluate the accuracy, um, assuming that like the data is balanced. Uh, but I, I think the goal is kind of like how like a student um, has like a midterm and like a final, it should be assessed on sort of the classes it's seen um, as opposed to like, okay, it just learned class four, we should just evaluate it on class four, it should um, be able like to do well on all of the digits I believe like that it's seen. Right, so it should be evaluated in all the classes that it's seen so far. Yeah. Okay, and you would uh, you would evaluate based on the accuracy of, of all of those. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Cool, is there anything else you would wanna add? That's it. All right, great, thank you. Um, all right, I'll ask the room number two, and I think some people don't remember their room numbers, so just if your group hasn't been called yet, you know, just go ahead and, and say something. I believe I was part of room number two. And <laughs> I can go next. So we discussed about the problem setting of, uh, you know, robot navigation uh, indoors. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you have robot inside the inside your apartment, your the layout of your apartment keeps changing continuously. You keep moving furnitures one place to another or you could even move from one apartment to another. And ideally you would want the same robot uh, to learn how to navigate in the new um, in the new apartment. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the ways you could train such a um, robot is in like Gibson environment or habitat environment. For example, there are different rooms uh, would be considered a different tasks. Um, and uh, one of the evaluation um, metric could be like, you know, shortest path taken from source to destination or like even different goals could be, you know, different uh, tasks. For example, you would want it to navigate to kitchen or some other room, um, things like that. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you would be checking how long it takes for it to find the shortest path to the destination. Is that right? Yeah. For how long um, the path would be? How I mean, like I don't know how to define shortest path here. Uh, what would you compare it with? Um, but yeah, I mean, essentially, uh, when you uh, when the let's say the furniture layout changes from one to another. Um, you'd still want to find um, like uh, the most efficient path from source to destination. Right. And uh, like one of the ways I can think of is you would use something like A star or something and you would want to do better than that. Um, but, but yeah, um, shortest path could be one evaluation metric. Right. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And what are, so given that this is a lifelong learning algorithm, you will be, as you said, you'll be given one room at a time. Uh, what are the desirable properties of such an algorithm? What would you want that algorithm to do? Um, <laughs> I 
Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know if uh, I don't know. Uh, and yeah, you can jump in. But uh, yeah, add to that. So basically, what we were discussing is it might happen that when the like the uh, environment changes, like the room changes or the furniture changes. So the bot may may get confused, maybe uh, like it the trajectory of which is the correct path. So it should be able to like ask the human, uh, like what direction should I take? So basically, it should have the ability to uh, somehow quantify the uncertainty. And if it's greater than some threshold, it should be able to ask and like then incorporate that feedback mm -hmm. right. to plan the, like the new trajectory. Okay, so should quantify uncertainty and uh, should ask for feedback. Yeah. Great. Um, right, is there anything else that you would like to add? Uh, no. Uh, yeah, I can't think of anything else. Okay, great, thank you. This is, this is great. Um, right, room number three. Yeah, hi, this is... Um... We have uh, selected uh, one of the examples listed in, in the slides. Uh, actually, we picked the number A, uh, student learning concept in school. Um, but maybe this can be applied also for a kind of digital learner, uh, which we feed it content, right? So um, we argued a little bit for, uh, for this example that there might be kind of two setups one is more explorative so similar like a reinforcement learning environment and another one which is um, more of a supervised kind of approach and um, and that is based on um, let's say similar environments like in different parts of the world where um, some some knowledge or some schools let's say are more spoon feeding rather than some other places where they let you um, experiment and learn so uh -huh. one one of the um, uh, desirable properties and considerations here is that you have some learning objectives, so you know what you want to learn uh, in different kind of uh, milestones uh -huh. and, and a given time frame to learn those uh, learning objectives. And um, every second or every uh, learning objective that is coming after the uh, after the, the previous one, uh, needs to be based on knowledge, uh, historical knowledge that you have learned before. Uh, so it's, it's incremental. Okay. And so you're, it's kind of given to you in some kind of curriculum. Yeah. Where yeah. each class goes on top of another. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of yeah. sense. Yeah, and uh, w one of the ways to evaluate that is to um, uh, stop, let's say, the training, carry out evaluation tests. Uh, but these evaluation tests uh, need to be, um, again, subject to the, to the setup, uh, either explorative and therefore use the knowledge that you have learned uh, on these sort of uh, explorative questions to understand whether it's like critical thinking um, uh, testing, right? Or uh, uh, just to find out, for example, what you have learned from, from the previous knowledge, if you can carry out a task within a given time frame. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. So you would stop training at a certain point and then you would test the ability of the algorithm to reason given all the previous knowledge. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, um, I think this is great. Um, is there anything else you would like to add? Um, no, this is what we had the time to discuss for. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, group number four. Hi. Yeah. So um, the sort of situation that we chose was um, a robot that's going from room to room and it's uh, recognizing objects that it sees. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think a key like characteristic that we identified is that the data set's constantly changing, like the distribution's changing, um, and it needs to be able to adapt to this. So both like learn new types of, I guess, like new instances that it may um, encounter, but also, um, I guess, like a, a properties that we'd like for it to be able to still remember, like previous uh, objects that it's recognized and 
So, you know, even if it hasn't seen an object in the last, like, five rooms, it can still recognize an object from the first room. Um, so it's some, some concept of memory. Um, and that uh, ideally, as it goes through the rooms, it can learn to recognize new objects better. Um, but we identify that, like, challenge of this or, like, a factor in this is how similar, I guess, like, how, how similar, like, those, like, future tasks are compared to um, previous tasks. So, mm -hmm. um, like, if future objects are a lot harder, you know, might not work out very well. Right, right. That, that makes a lot of sense. And so how would you evaluate these properties? For example, learning new objects better or whether you're good at, um, at, uh, at whether you have some kind of memory. How would you evaluate that? Yeah, I, I think um, you would sort of treat it as like a few shot learner where every time it moves to a new um, moves to a new room and encounters almost like a, it's not I guess it's not really a new task, but there are new instances that it has to recognize. So um, I, I, I guess yeah, you can evaluate like a few shot learner where you give it just a few examples and see how if it can, I guess it'd be accuracy having only seen a few examples of new types of objects. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so accuracy here. All right, great. Anything else we want to add? I, I think that was all. Yeah, it was pretty challenging. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, all right, room number five, which I think at some point we reassign people to other rooms. So either five or six. I was actually in five in the beginning, and then I got assigned to four. I see. Okay, great. Then room number six. Hi. Um. Yeah, I think I think that's us. <laughs> if I'm remembering the number correctly. Um. So the context we we're looking at was was one of the um given ones with uh young. Yeah, Robot trying to learn uh, a bunch of different tasks and series. Um, so we're picturing like being able to, you know, manipulate different objects and play different instruments. Or um, that was kind of the image, one mm -hmm. of the images we had in our heads. Um, and then the uh, the setup to develop a task would be you either have like multiple rooms in each room. It's it's trying to do a different task, or you add objects to the same room. And it's learning to do different tasks in that room. Pretty similar to some of uh, the other stuff you've heard. Um, discussed. Um, one one discussion we had that um, I thought was kind of interesting was like, okay, so we had this idea that a lot of times you want it to not be forgetting the old tasks, but we were wondering what should happen in those cases where, like, say, say there's something equivalent to like learning a bad habit or learning something that like then becomes you know inadvisable later or something. Like, do you need some? How do you deal with kind of that? Uh, maybe there's times when it makes sense to forget some. Some skill or to like relearn relearn particular skills and like how do you how you deal with uh that process with something we weren't really sure <laughs> how, how exactly you would you would want to do that or like set up evaluations uh, for that um but yeah in, in terms of desirable properties it was like most of the time probably don't forget the old ones although there was you know the discussion along that and then uh, that kind of sense of you want to be able to leverage uh, old tasks to more quickly learn new tasks in, you know, sort of mammal-like idea. Um, uh, and then in terms of evaluation, uh, when we're thinking about, like, you, you can do something where you're shuffling the tasks and seeing how different, you know, time paths, uh, like, if you, how the order of the tasks you learn affects how well you learn them. Um, to, you know, see if you really are leveraging old ones or if there's, and also just doing them each as individual tasks uh, mm -hmm. like in a sequence. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And the comment about being careful about what to remember, I think this is really insightful. I haven't thought about this. This is a really good point. Um, so you would see how the order affects tasks, mm -hmm. how the ordering of tasks affects the performance. Um, great. And then you would also evaluate some kind of backward transfer. So how good are you at not forgetting the older stuff? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Although with the caveat of like, <laughs> maybe it's like a nuanced process. If, 
mm-hmm. if you are learning like a change preference or something, but yeah, some sort of you want to retain probably most of most of what you learned. Yeah, great. Um, thank you. Um, and we have the last room, I believe, room number seven. Yeah, I can I can speak for room seven. Um, so we also talked about uh, kind of a robot learning uh, multiple tasks uh, or like continually learning more and more tasks. Um, and so kind of our idea behind it was we wanted um, the the agent to be able to still perform well on old tasks, but be quick to pick up new tasks and get them to a point that we uh, that would be like good for that task. Um, so we were thinking maybe you would compare it between the end result of training for the task alone versus how far you could get or how much faster you could get to a similar point, um, having accumulated the skills of previous tasks or accumulated some kind of middle state from previous tasks. Uh, so you would evaluate it both on end performance and on how quickly you reach end performance, um, given how many previous tasks you've seen. Right, right. Okay, so that would be the end performance and also how how long it takes to get there. Yeah, kind of the idea being that it's built up some skills along the way or some kind of middle amount of skills of state that it can be quick to use. Right, right. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, great. Is there anything else you would like to add? I think this, that was what we spent the most time on, was this kind of evaluation setup. Awesome. Um, thank you. Um, is there anybody else uh, who was in a different room that we haven't talked about yet that would like to talk about uh, their thought process or discussion? All right, I think there shouldn't be anyone, so that's great. Um, thank you very much. This was this was really, really a lot of fun for me, definitely, just to hear your thoughts about this. And I think a lot of them are along the lines of things that that you think about when you try to design a system like this. And uh, I think one thing we can notice here is that uh, there's quite a lot of diversity in what uh, desirable properties and considerations are and how we would evaluate them. Uh, we talked about things such as you know, coming up with the right or doing things in a certain curriculum, which is more about how do we order these tasks. We talked about the notion of memory and how we should be able to uh, still know how to do things that we learned in the past, but at the same time, we would want to get better at learning a uh, new tasks as we know more and more. And then we talked about different evaluation setups, and this was, I thought, really fun. So different robot navigation settings, uh, also more real life settings such as students in school, um, robots with uh, not necessarily doing navigation, but just handling different tasks or objects, MNIST digits and all kinds of things. Um, so thanks a lot. Um, and I did that exercise myself a little bit too and came up with a few variations, uh, which I think a lot of you came up with as well. So let me list those. So first, the, um, the task and data order might matter, as I think someone said in the student case, where we might want to have a curriculum of tasks where one build on top of the previous one. But we could also imagine these tasks being given to you IID, or uh, they can be given to you in an adversarial fashion. So for example, you're playing with a game with someone, and that, that other agent is trying to uh, find a, a strategy that would uh, that, that uh, that is trying to, to, to beat you. So it's basically uh, it's trying to find your weakness um, or something that is predictable where such as, for example, seasons where you can tell that there was a change coming um, and you can predict when the, when the new task or data distribution will come. Another aspect that we haven't talked that much about is um, whether there are discrete task boundaries or continuous shifts, right? So we can imagine discrete task boundaries where for example, you have different subjects in school and you know that one subject ends and another begins. But we can also imagine continuous shifts when the robot is playing with a bunch of objects and then these objects are slowly being exchanged. Or for example, in the navigation scenario, the rooms are slowly changing and it's hard to tell at which point you are given a different task. There's also a question whether these are known to you or not. Uh, so you can know that something changed, someone can tell you, you know, now you're in a different room, you have to learn 
or um, you might just experience this and you need to adjust to that. And some considerations in terms of the evaluation is uh, model performance. I think a lot of you mentioned this, data efficiency. Some people mentioned that as well. And then things such as computational resources uh, and memory. Um, but there are also other things, and we'll talk about this in a second, such as privacy or interpretability, fairness, and a lot of them, or test time compute and memory, a lot of them apply to a general machine learning problems, to general machine learning problems, but some of them are uh, more specific to, uh, or, or more common in the lifelong learning scenario. All right, so we can already tell from this exercise and even from the slide that there's a substantial variety in a problem statement. And this is a really important point that I would like you to, to remember when, when you read papers on lifelong learning. All right, so um, I'll try to create a general supervised online learning problem and given those considerations, but I'll try to make it quite specific. So we'll be given data points over time. And the problem would look as following. We'll observe the data point. Then we'll try to predict the label for the data point. This is a supervised online learning problem. And then we'll get to observe the, the true label. All right, and if the setting is IID, then our distribution will be not dependent on time. So it doesn't matter at which point you're sampling from the distribution P of X or P of Y given X, you'll be given, you'll be sampling from the same distribution. Um, but uh, we can also consider a problem where the distribution is dependent on time. So depending on when you sample from it, uh, it will look differently. And then there's also a streaming setting where uh, the assumption is that you cannot store the current sample that you see. So there could be various reasons for this. For example, it's just too big and you don't necessarily have the memory to store that, or you don't have enough computational resources, such as for example, when you have to classify videos really quickly, you don't really want to um, store them. Uh, there are also privacy considerations. So um, you could be in the in the case of the medical assistant, um, you don't you're not allowed to store the the patient's data, but you need to be able to use that to make better prediction. Or when you want to study neural memory mechanisms, where we as humans don't really have hard drives where we can save our data to. So in general, the streaming setting is true in some cases, but in many cases, these are not necessarily the considerations that. We, we have to consider. In a lot of the examples that we talked about, uh, these were not the most important constraints. Um, and in particular, remember that, for example, in reinforcement learning, we use replay buffers um, almost for, for any off-policy algorithm. So there's, it's fairly easy to store the data for us. All right, um, so what do we want from a lifelong learning algorithm? Um, and there is a particular, there are two particular measures that are, um, I think, quite principled that it's useful to, to know about. One of them is regret or minimal regret. So we want a regret that will grow slowly with the number of data points or with the number of tasks. And regret is, uh, has a strict mathematical definition and is defined as the cumulative loss of the learner minus the cumulative loss of the best learner in hindsight. Right, so what that means is a formula that looks like this, where the first part, um, the part, let me just put my hand real quick. So the part right here is cumulative loss, loss of the learner. So here we have our loss that depends on the, uh, the, the loss for the current task, LT, or for the current data point. And we have the parameters theta, so we don't have control over that loss. Uh, this is just something that measures the performance of our algorithm. And then we have our parameters theta that we get to pick at time step t. And this is what our algorithm can produce. So this is what we do have control over. And then we do the cumulative loss across all of the data points or all of the tasks minus the best, uh, the cumulative loss of the best learner in hindsight. So if we knew all of the tasks up front, we would, uh, and we would find the best theta for all of them how would that difference grow with, with the number of tasks, with new tasks, right? So this is the notion of regret. And um, the goal usually is, uh, so one, one point here is that it's really difficult to evaluate in practice because we would need to run this every single time, uh, but it's useful for analysis for different algorithms. Um, and uh, one thing to note is that regret that grows linearly in T is trivial. And um, can you tell me why? 
Or can you give me an example of a regret like this? Um, or rather of a learner that achieves a, a linear regret in T. Um, please either raise your hand or just speak up. Any ideas about the regret that will grow linearly in T? All right, this is this might be a little tricky. Um, so let me try to give you one example. Um, so for instance, if we had an algorithm that trains each task from scratch, so every time you get a new task, you train it from scratch, then this term would grow linearly with T. So at every task, assuming that they're of the same uh, difficulty, it will be getting uh, kind of the regret will be getting bigger and bigger by the same amount. So it will grow linearly with time or with tasks. All right. Is this does this make sense more or less? Or are there any questions? Yep. Can you explain it again, like how the task like this regret will be with time? And also another thing, this small t is it the time step or the tasks that we encounter? Right. So um, I think you can. So it it kind of depends on the setting. You can either consider this as a task where you're given a single data point that can be also considered a task. But let's say these are. This is the data point. So t is the um, small t is the current data point, and uh, our theta t are the parameters that your uh, lifelong learning algorithm can come up with um, for the particular data point t, right? And then the capital T is uh, across all the data points that you get to see, and you get to see them in sequence. So now the first part. Is telling you what's the cumulative loss, so the loss that you sum up over each one of the of the data points for uh, your parameters theta t, and then the the second the, the second part of this equation tells you what is the best the cumulative loss of the best learner in hindsight. So across all the data points, if you saw all of the data points at once, and you 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 could find the param the best parameters theta for those, uh, what would be the cumulative loss for that? Right. So this is kind of like our our oracle, the best that we could do. Right? So the reason why uh, an algorithm that would train um, on each data point from scratch has a linear regret um, is because assuming that each data point is as difficult as the previous one, um, that term will grow linear, linearly, linearly. Right? So basically, at every point, you will be getting a constant loss and then you will be summing that up. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. All right, cool. All right, so there is one other measure that uh, I would like to introduce, and this is um, positive and negative transfer. And this is maybe a little bit, bit easier. So the positive forward transfer is, um, is something that a lot of you mentioned in the um, during the discussion is where the previous task caused you to do better on future tasks. Right? So that means that as you get more tasks, you're getting better and better on future tasks. And this is compared to learning future tasks from scratch. And then the positive backward transfer would mean that the current task caused you to do better on previous tasks. Right? So as you learn more and more, you're getting better at the tasks that you have already seen. And this is also compared to learning past tests from scratch. And if you want to talk about, instead of the positive transfer, uh, you want to talk about the negative transfer, then you need to change the word better to the word worse. And that will be the definition of that. There are a couple of questions about regret in the chat. So the first question is with linear regret, can we say that there is no or minimal knowledge learning or transfer from previous tasks? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So if there is no uh, positive transfer or if there is nothing that you're learning from each task as it comes, then you're getting linear regret. That basically means that you're not really learning from the process of getting these tasks. Nick is asking, can regret be negative if choosing just a single data ends up being too restrictive? Can regret be negative? I see. So I think the question is, if the 
if a single data is not really able to capture uh, all of the tasks at once, can, can we do better than that Oracle? I think usually in regret, we assume that the, the, the part on the right side is the Oracle. So we assume that we have enough parameters to find uh, the, the right setting to, to, to find the minimal loss. So I think usually we don't uh, consider negative regret. All right, cool. Are there any other questions at this point? So we talked about the problem statement and we talked quite a lot about this. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about some basic approaches that we can use to tackle that. Um, but before we go there, are there any other questions? All right, if there are no questions, then let's jump into the approaches. So I'll tell you about some very, very basic approaches. So it might seem very, very obvious that this is what you should be doing, but still I think it's important to write them out. Um, so one approach is that we can just store all the data that we've seen so far and train on it, right? That's relatively simple and that actually has a name and the name is follow the leader algorithm, right? So this is whatever you have seen so far, you just keep adding to it and you will take that buffer of data and you'll train on it. So the advantage of that is that this actually has a pretty strong baseline. Uh, you're training on all the tasks that you have seen so far, you're in this kind of batch-like setting um, and this usually works really well. This is really computationally intensive because with every new task or with every new data point, uh, you would have to do the computation in all of the tasks. One thing that can help here is continuous fine tuning instead. So you can warm start your model from the previous iteration and just perform fine tuning um, instead of uh, training everything from scratch every time you get a new data point. And it could be also quite memory intensive because you have to load the entire data set every time. But that, yeah, that depends. All right, then um, another approach that is extremely simple is that you can take a gradient step on the data point you observe. So you get a new data point, you have your model, you can just take the gradient step on that data point. And uh, it also has a name and that name is stochastic gradient descent as hopefully most of us are familiar with. So we'll be, every time we get a new data, we'll perform a the gradient step on it, um, and it will allow us to move towards the um, uh, to, to, towards the direction that minimizes the loss. Right, this is very computationally cheap. We we just need to perform one gradient step on the data point. It requires zero memory, so we can just take the, the uh, compute the gradient, take it, and that's it. We don't need to store the data. Um, but it's subject to negative backward transfer, right? So if we only get to do gradient steps on the new trait on the new data that is coming in, um, that might mean that we can forget about all the old data that we've seen. Right? And because of this, that might lead to us forgetting about what we've done previously. And uh, this is often referred to as forgetting or um, also referred to as catastrophic forgetting depending on the application. And uh, I think we, we also know from stochastic gradient descent, very often we need to do multiple epochs. We need to go over the data multiple times and it requires quite some time to, to for, for this to, to converge. So it'd be quite a slow learning algorithm. All right, so these are um, basic approaches that kind of we can think of straight away. And I wanted to show you one implementation of such a very simple approach in the reinforcement learning scenario. So this will be a very simple continual reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, and this is work done by uh, Ryan, Julian um, and, and co-authors. So in this work, we have seven robots that collected 500,000 grasps. And this is the similar setting that you have seen when we were discussing the QT of the paper when we were talking about Q-learning. So we have these robots uh, that uh, then we can evaluate how well they can do grasping. We, we train the policy using reinforcement learning and uh, given a specific bin and this set of objects, they can achieve 86% success rate on grasping these objects. Okay. But then we can also find a scenario where the, where the algorithm is not that good. So for example, in this case, we threw a, a few transparent bottles into the bin and you know, these are visually challenging objects and the algorithm did not perform nearly as well. So the, the evaluation performance of that algorithm was just 49%. Right. So 
we can consider this as like a very little sliver of a lifelong learning scenario where you're presented with a slightly new condition or you're in a slightly new environment or in this case, you're dealing with slightly different objects and you need to adapt to it quickly, right? So the, the kind of mental model that you can have in mind, something like this, we have our pre-training task that we trained all these robots on. This was this 580,000 grasps. We have the old data that is stored somewhere on disk. And we have a policy that we trained using some offline reinforcement learning algorithm. And then we have a new data uh, that we, for example, use to compute that number 49%. And now we need to use that new data, combine it with the policy that we have so far and perform some kind of adaptation procedure so that we are getting better at this new task. Right, so this is the, the adaptation procedure that we came up with, and this is really, really simple. So let me quickly go over this. So here um, on the left, here you see the, the base data set. So this is the data set that we originally uh, created, uh, and this was um, around 608,000 grasps. And this achieved 86% success rate, as we, as we mentioned before. So this was then used to use the QTOP for the, in the QTOP algorithm to train a Q function. So to train our, uh, from that, we can get our policy that can achieve that 86% that success rate. And then we'll use that policy to collect a little bit more data in a slightly different scenario. So for example, in transparent bottles, or we tried a few other scenarios as well, and that would yield a much lower success rate. And we'll collect a little bit of data in that scenario. So less than 800 grasps. Then we'll mix the data 50-50 uh, with, the, with the base data set that we had. And then we'll fine tune our Q function based on that mixture of data that we collected. All right, so we have the data set here and now we are fine tuning our Q function. So we are warm starting the model from the previous Q function and uh, we are fine tuning it using the data. And from that, we get the adapted Q function that hopefully will perform better at that task. Right. Okay, so um, we evaluated this in a few different scenarios that were quite challenging for the robot. So here are the scenarios. So on the left, this is the pre-training that achieved 86%. And then we are looking for scenarios where the robot wouldn't perform as well. So one is harsh lighting conditions. There are transparent bottles that we talked about as well. We also found that checkerboard backing was really confusing for the robot. It would very often try to grasp at the edges of the checkerboard. And then we also changed the morphology a little bit. So we extended the grouper to be a little bit longer. And we also offset the grouper a little bit to the right where you can see that the gripper is supposed to be here, but it's a little bit offset by 10 centimeters. And here at the top, you can see the results of the base policy running in these conditions. So you can see that in every single time, it's quite a bit lower than 86%. Than 86 and after the simple fine tuning procedure, these numbers went up by quite a bit. So we have a simple, fine, very, very simple fine tuning procedure that continues to use reinforcement learning. Um, and it can improve the performance quite a bit. All right, so we talk here about a continual learning or lifelong learning. So how does that, that little sliver of that problem help us here? So since this procedure is so simple, we can actually apply it over and over again. Right? So we can collect our initial grasping data set, uh, do our uh, adaptation procedure right here uh, using the the, the new data set. And then given that result, we can continue doing this and kind of change the environment again and continue doing it again and so on. So we did this experiment and we found that it's actually the, the performance that you get uh, by doing this continually is fairly similar to the performance that we got in the, in the single uh, time fine tuning procedure. Right? So this was an example of a very simple continual array algorithm that works very, that, that, that is basically follow the leader algorithm where we are doing fine tuning as opposed to training in all of the tasks. Um, but here we are doing this with reinforcement learning. Right, does this make sense? Is this clear? Are there any questions? Okay, there's a question on chat. When you fine tune, you only evaluate on the respective data or in totality, like previous data sets as well. Yeah, this is a great question. So we are only evaluating this on the, respective data. So on the data that we are fine tuning on. So it is, you know, it, it is uh, potentially true that if we tested the backward transfer, so whether we can still do well, for example, on the harsh light that we tried at the very beginning, 
the performance might have dropped. And so we didn't really evaluate the backward transfer. All right, if there are no other questions, then one question that I would wanna ask is, um, this is so far we discussed very simple algorithms. So the question is, can we do better than this? All right, so let me briefly introduce um, one approach that, that allows us to do this. And I will go over this fairly quickly because uh, we're slowly running out of time. So, um, the idea is as following. Can we modify vanilla stochast, um, SGD, stochastic gradient descent, to avoid negative backward transfer? And so here, the others are focusing more on the negative backward transfer, so the, the concept of forgetting. And this is the paper by uh, Lopez Pass and Ronzato uh, called Gradient Episodic Memory for Continual Learning. And the idea is as following. They'll store a small amount of data per task in memory. So this is not necessarily the entire data so that you get to see, but for every task, we'll store a little bit of it in memory. And then when making updates for new tasks, they will try to make sure that they don't unlearn previous tasks. Right? So this is fairly common. Um, and you know the, the idea is kind of fairly obvious. You're trying to learn in such a way that you don't forget about the things that you know, knew, knew before. But the question is, how do you actually accomplish this? So in this paper, they try to tackle this from an optimization perspective. And in particular, they propose something like this. Uh, they start with learning a, a predictor. So this is our uh, predictor, our function f of theta that you're learning. And this is given a current data point and some task zt. And you're trying to learn the, the, the label for that. And here we also assume that we have memory for the cave task or for the task ZK, memory that is denoted as MK. And now for, for each task, we'll try to minimize the, the loss as we usually do uh, for, that, for that new data point, for that new task. But we'll do it subject to this constraint, the constraint right here. And what that constraint says, this is basically us trying to ensure point number two. So what this constraint says is that um, our loss for the uh, for other for another task for the previous task zk, right, that, that we can evaluate based on the data that we start in the memory for that task, should be um, uh, lesser or equal to uh, the loss that we had at the previous iteration for that task. So basically, we are not allowed our loss is not allowed to go up for the task that we are not training on. Right? So basically loss on the previous task does not get worse. And in particular, the way that they're trying to achieve this is that they assume the local linear, linearity of the optimization landscape. And by doing so, they can express that constraint as following as the inner product between the gradient uh, with respect to uh, our current task, our uh, data point T, and the other tasks uh, that can be evaluated based on the memory MK. Right? So if that inner product is uh, non-negative, that means that there is only positive or non-transfer. Right? So basically, if these two gradients are perpendicular to each other, that means that when we are taking gradient with respect to our current task, we won't be negatively influencing any other task that are completely independent. And if that inner product is positive, that means that by taking uh, the loss for our task, uh, by taking the gradient towards uh, uh, that, that makes our task better, we'll be also making other tasks better at the same time. All right, and they try to ensure it for all of the previous tasks. Uh, and then they formulate it and solve it as a quadratic program. All right, so a little bit about the experiments. They tried uh, three different experiments that are quite common in this uh, literature, such as MNIST permutations, where they're permuting different pixels in the MNIST digits, in MNIST images. They also tried uh, different rotations of MNIST digits that are given to you in sequence, as well as uh, CIFAR 100, where um, they were assuming that each task would involve five new classes. All right, uh, the total memory size that they were using was uh, 5,012 examples that was split among um, the tasks that they were considering. And here are some of the results. So first, I would like you to focus on the pure accuracy. So one of the things that we discussed was how would you measure a, a continual learning algorithm? You would just 
look at look at the accuracy of that algorithm. And here you can see that their method called GM uh, or GEM achieves really good accuracy. And then it also presents positive backward transfer as well as pos slightly positive or almost zero forward transfer. But then more interestingly, you can see the result on the right here where they show how that performance declines or how does performance change after you after seeing more and more tasks. So here on the x-axis, we are seeing the task number or the number of tasks you get you, you saw so far. And on the y-axis is the performance of task number one. Right. So at this point, you learn task number one. This was your original performance. And as you get to see more and more tasks, your performance stays more or less constant. It doesn't drop because you're and learning with this constraint that prevents you from uh, uh, from forgetting. All right, it's a little bit of a problem, but hopefully we'll get to the end. Um, so then um, they also evaluated this on endless rotations and showed very similar results, as well as uh, CIFAR 100, where we can see that this curve stays high uh, as opposed to the other curves that drop quite a bit uh, because they're subject to the to negative transfer. The negative backward transfer. Right, and one thing to consider when looking at papers that talk about continual learning and propose these algorithms is that sometimes the assumptions that they make and the algorithms that they introduce, they don't necessarily apply to the particular experiments that they were running. So in this case, if we took a step back um, and we looked at the, the assumptions that they started with where you can't just store all the data for all the previous tasks, um, you know, this is not necessarily true in this case. You're operating on endless uh, digits and you can fairly easily store all the images that you get to see. So uh, some of the assumptions maybe don't match with the experimental domain. And this is something to pay attention to. And this is quite tricky to do. Find the right experimental domain that is kind of realistic and shows the, uh, the properties of your algorithm. Right, and there are also approaches that uh, do this using uh, meta-learning that try to avoid negative backward transfer through that. And uh, here are some papers that I, uh, that I would suggest you to take a look at that, that try to do this. All right, so in the last 10 minutes or so, uh, we will talk about revisiting the problem statement from the meta-learning perspective. So how can we change that problem statement such that we can apply some of our meta-learning algorithms that we learned about um, so that so that it's the, the problem statement is a little bit more tailored towards those and it's I think more makes more sense in general. Are there any questions at this point? All right. In the meantime, I'll quickly um, adjust my charger. Just one second. All right. Um, There's one quick question in the chat uh, asking about SNAIL, which is the simple neural attentive meta-learner. Um, SNAIL reminds me of continual learning. Is it an example of continuous learning? Right. So maybe that's um, a question that you, Chelsea, can say something about since you've covered SNAIL before. What do you think? Yeah, I can, I can take that. So um, the SNAIL algorithm, it is really a, a meta-learning algorithm that kind of can adapt to a data set using an attention-based architecture. Uh, like uh, Carl will just will discuss in a minute, you can actually kind of take meta learning algorithms and apply them to online settings. But the snail algorithm itself is not a lifelong learning algorithm because it just adapts to a fixed data set rather than like an evolving, um, evolving stream of data. All right, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Great, okay. So um, let's talk about how we can revisit the, the lifelong learning problem statement from the meta-learning perspective. So the original online learning formulation um, that was introduced in, in these two papers um, focuses on a very specific setting 
where we have to perform sequence of tasks while minimizing static regret. So what that means is that you're given tasks in sequence and your performance is measured as soon as you're given a new task, right? So you don't have any additional um, time to kind of adapt to this task. You will, the, the clock will start ticking or will start measuring your performance as soon as you get to see that new task, right? So it's basically tries to measure the zero shot performance. The better you are at being really good at this task straight away, the better that metric will be. But more realistically, what we would want to do is to be presented the task and then given a little bit of time to learn the new task, to adapt to the new task, and then being evaluated on the task. Right? So we want to get a little bit of time to just figure out what the task is and then, and then be evaluated on this. So we'll do this over time and slowly learn next task and next task and so on. And then we would want to evaluate the performance of it as opposed to evaluating the performance straight away, zero shot. And we would also want to do it such that initially we start learning quite slowly, but eventually it gets faster and faster. So we can learn new tasks much more rapidly the more tasks we are given. All right, so um, in this paper, um, the others propose to uh, formulate an online meta-learning problem where we try to efficiently learn a sequence of tasks from a non-stationary distribution. Um, so in that case, the, uh, the performance, the evaluation will be done after seeing a small, a small amount of data, right? So we'll have this short burn-in period where you can quickly adapt. And after that, the performance will be evaluated. So it's important to note that the difference between these two is just in evaluation rather than in the data stream. You're still given the tasks that are coming in sequence, but you're being evaluated slightly differently. In the, in the online meta learning case, you are given a small, a short burning period that allows you to adapt a little bit. All right. So um, let's talk about this online meta learning setting and let's introduce a simple algorithm that will remind you of an algorithm that you have seen before. Um, so for the online meta learning setting, we'll iterate over tasks. And then first we'll observe this little data set, the training data set for the, the task that you're given at, at the current time step. And that will be the data set from the burning period. And then um, we'll have to come up with some update procedure that will produce the parameters for our learner, for, 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 our, uh, for our function. So parameters uh, uh, phi t, for instance. And then we'll get to observe the data point, predict the label for the data point using the parameters. So the parameters, the function that is parameterized, uh, so to that, that is parameterized by phi t. That is an output of our update procedure that we get to that we get to adjust based on our burning period. And then we'll get to observe the label. So these, these, the, the last part of that of the for loop is basically equivalent to the st standard online setting where you're observing the data point, predicting the, the label for it, and then you observe the label. But here, the, the first part kind of allows you to, do, to use that burning period to learn a better update procedure. And the goal is similar to, to the goal that we had before. So we're trying to find a learning algorithm with sublinear regret. We defined regret before, where it's a difference between the loss of the of your algorithm, the cumulative loss of your algorithm, minus the loss of the best algorithm in hindsight. All right, so given that the problem setting, can we apply meta-learning in this lifelong learning setting? So if we recall follow the leader algorithm, uh, the basic idea is that we will store all the data that we've seen so far, and then we'll train on it. And then once we train on it, we'll deploy it on the current task. So here we'll change it slightly and we'll say, we'll introduce the follow the meta leader algorithm where we'll store, store all the data that we've seen so far, but instead of just training on it, we'll meta train on it to um, get to a better update procedure. And then we'll run that update procedure on the current task. Right, so it's very, very close, uh, but slightly different. And um, you know, given that follow the meta leader idea, what do you think are good meta learning algorithms that would work well for that for follow met the meta leader algorithm. And uh, this might be a little tricky question. So just to, to guide you a little bit, consider a setting where that uh, our distribution of tasks is non-stationary. So the tasks, the new tasks that you're given are 
maybe a little bit out of distribution and you need to extrapolate a little bit. And in particular, remember um, at some point, Chelsea was talking about uh, black box meta learners versus optimization or gradient based meta learning algorithms. So what do you think? What are a good meta learning algorithms that are well suited for uh, follow the meta leader? Please either raise your hand or um, you can answer in the chat. or you can just speak up straight away. An LSTM, okay. So uh, an optimization-based meta learner uh, could be, that's one option. Optimization-based since all data is available at all times and you can warm, you can do warm restarts, LMAML, okay. Right, so in particular, what I'm trying to point to here is, um, I think what Chelsea mentioned in, in the previous lec in one of the previous lectures is that the optimization based, the gradient based meta learning algorithms are potentially a little bit better at extrapolating, at finding at, at the task that is a little bit out of distribution, um, as opposed to the the uh, black box meta learners that are not as good at extrapolating and and uh, they're they're more uh, they're, they're doing more of an interpolation between the tasks that we've already seen. All right, um, so um, that uh, online meta learning paper um, introduces an algorithm that, that uses uh, MAML to do this. So um, one, of the, one of the answers in chat was, was, was correct. Uh, it basically does follow the meta leader, leader algorithm where we are doing the, um, the meta training using the MAML algorithm. And they evaluate the, um, the algorithm based on a sequence of um, tasks. Um, so first they do it with colored or rotated or scaled MNIST digits. They also try a task of uh, 3D object pose prediction where you're given uh, uh, viewpoints of, of a new object and you have to tell what's the orientation of that object with respect to some uh, frame of reference. In this case, this red dot on the table. And then they also do C4100 classification where new classes are considering new task. All right, so we'll look at the few comparisons. So first comparison, first baseline would be uh, called uh, TO or TOE, uh, where they just train on all the data that was uh, that they've seen so far. Then uh, they'll also try to follow the leader algorithm, uh, which is a little bit different here, given that the online meta learning uh, online meta learning setting, where they get to train on all the data so far, but they will also use the data from the per, uh, burning period to fine tune on that so that they can take the full advantage of the setting. So this is the version of follow the leader that, that kind of takes advantage of that online meta learning setting. And then they'll also uh, try training from scratch on each one of the tasks, right? And I'll just quickly show you the, the results. And um, here we can see in terms of the training efficiency. So how many data points does the algorithm require to get to a certain performance? And here at the bottom of the x-axis, we see the task index. We can see that FTML algorithm can uh, is, is much efficient, much more efficient than all the other baselines, and it gets more efficient as it gets to see more and more tasks. So it's getting better and better at, at learning. And then here on the right, we see the learning proficiency, which uh, which is basically measured after a burning period of a uh, hundred tasks, I believe, or a hundred data points. Excuse me, uh, where uh, you see that. The performance of the of the algorithm itself, uh, or the, the error of the of the algorithm itself, is also the best. So it's uh, it can achieve smaller and smaller error, and uh, as as it gets to see more tasks. So in this case, follow the meta leader learns each new task faster, but also with greater proficiency, and eventually it can approach kind of the, the future learning regime where you just need a few examples to be able to learn the new task. All right, um, so we are slightly over time, but I'll um, ask you for questions right after this. Um, so just a few takeaways that I wanted you to, um, to take away from this. So uh, first of all, there are many flavors of lifelong learning and they all exist under the same name. So we went through the exercise where you kind of realized yourself how many different versions of lifelong learning you can come up with. And very often when you read these papers, 
uh, they refer to it as to the same concept. They're all doing lifelong learning, but the problem, the specific problem setting is slightly different. So pay attention to that. And very often, defining the problem statement itself is the hardest part of a lifelong learning algorithm. Once you have a very crisp problem statement definition, you can uh, relatively easily easily come up with a, with an algorithm that can that can address it. And meta learning can be viewed as a slice of the lifelong learning problem, where you're just doing adaptation to the to the next task. And uh, as, as we mentioned at the beginning, this is a very open area of research. This is, I think, one of the most open-ended, uh, kind of uh, one of the most open-ended lectures that, that we've had here, where uh, there's a lot of research in the area, and even the problem statement is still being researched, and that's not uh, very very strictly defined. Um, all right, and this is it. So uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions at this point? Yeah, there's a question from. I, I want to ask more about the example where you have, I think it was six Sawyer arms, and then you're trying to pick up a grasp object. Uh, in that, I was wondering uh -huh. if when you you train on around eight, uh, or you fine tune around 800 grasps, and I was wondering um, if you had tried uh, train on everything in that scenario. And uh, when you found some evidence of benefiting from fine tuning, uh, how that would have done, how that, that would have compared against uh, train on everything or train from scratch on that time. Right, right. yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, this is a really good question. So um, I think maybe a few points. So first of all, because we had so many um, grasps from the pre-training data set, I think one worry is that these 800 grasp will just disappear in the sea of data from all the other tasks. So it might not pay as much attention to that new setting. And I think because of this, it will probably get worse than in the fine tuning case. Um, and then secondly, just from the um, computation resources perspective, uh, training this on the, on the entire data set every time will take around three to four days on multiple machines. Um, so it's just like a, an, an unfeasible problem or an unfeasible really uh, you know, proposition where every time you see some kind of change in the environment, you need to retrain and wait for three days to, to have the, the policy that can, that, can learn, that can perform in that new setting. And um, I right? So probably by the time you, you train the entire algorithm, it will be already, uh, you'll be in a different setting. And I was just a little confused on the on the arrows. So you trained on. I was wondering why you didn't share learning between the different uh, fine tuning tasks. So like the like transparency checkerboard, uh, the different kinds of grippers. I was wondering why there wasn't any shared learning between those tasks. I see. So by shared learning, do you mean why didn't we construct a data set that had all of the different modifications yeah. and try to point into that? No, as in why, um, why the, the network parameters weren't shared between the different subtasks, but they were just shared between the main uh, task and the six different subtasks. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah. So let me clarify this. Um, so um, the, the way we were doing fine tuning is that we would start from that original pre-training uh, poli pre policy. And then we'll do, we'll warm start our new policy from that. So it will have the exact same parameters and then we'll fine tune to the next task. At this point, we'll have the parameters of that new policy that perform quite well on that next task. And then we'll fine tune that one again. So we'll oh. warm start the next one from this and kind of keep going. So does that direction matter? Like which you do first, which you do second? Do you do more general tasks ahead, upstream, more specific tasks yeah. upstream or the other way around? Yeah, that's a really good question. We didn't really evaluate it, um, at least in terms of the order of the fine tuning task. If I were to guess, I think that the uh, it's important to pre-train on as big of a family of tasks or as big of a data set as possible, so that fine tuning is easier. So I don't think you should change and start training on 800 grasps and then fine tune to 800,000 grasps. Okay. Um, 
But I think in terms of the order of the fine tuning tasks, we didn't really evaluate this, but I think that would be really interesting. And I don't really have a good intuition of what the good, what the, what the good ordering would be. I feel a quick minute. I never kind of understand why um, the what, uh, what it means for the thing to be linear uh, for the for linear regret. I was wondering why, if you could explain again, why the loss on each task could be constant. Um, I see. So if we if we um, Assuming that each task is of similar difficulty, um, then for, and assuming that we train each task from scratch, right, or each data point from scratch, um, th the loss that we would get after training, assuming the same difficulty, should probably be very similar across different tasks, right? So I give you a, a data point or a bunch of data points, and I ask you to train on it, and uh, these are very similar to each other. So after you train on it, Probably the loss between all of them will be very close. Does that does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Right. So then, if you're cumulatively adding that loss every single time step, that will be a linear function of the number of times. I see. Um, yeah, and what and just to, if maybe if you have another thirty seconds, what does it mean for it to be locally linear? And is that and when the the Lapaz paper solved it, I think uh, they said the formula is a QP. Uh, and is that an assumption that's justified in general? Yeah, so I think overall reasoning about the optimization landscape of um, these uh, of, of, of neural networks that have been millions of parameters is really, really difficult. These are highly nonlinear landscapes where it's very difficult to, to say something about them. And there's a few papers that try to characterize this, but it's overall really, really tricky. Um, the, the local linear assumptions uh, assumes that uh, at least for the next gradient step, the landscape is linear. And that's an assumption that people commonly, commonly make in order to make any sort of analysis how a gradient would influence other tasks, for example. And this was done in a few papers, um, either that do multitask learning or continual learning, but that's a fairly common assumption, I would say. Okay, thank you. And it's kind of necessary if you want to really reason about the landscape. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's also a question cool. that I was answering in the chat, um, but you could also give your opinion. Uh, are there works that study basically the the, um, the task order and the difficulty of the tasks versus an IID distribution? Um, sorry, ordering the task based on the difficulty versus an IID distribution. Yeah. Um... There's no particular papers that come to mind right now. Um, if I were to guess, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not familiar with any theory on this or any even in, well, I guess we can come up with some kind of intuition at least for reinforcement learning problems where you would probably want to start with tasks that can help explore for the next tasks or that are a little bit broader than the, than the next task that you want to adjust to. Um, but I think this is more of an intuition than something that uh, you know, has been has been truly shown. Um, and in case of the supervised learning problem, I'm not sure if um, if if there's any research on the ordering of tasks there. Yeah, in the supervised learning setting, I added one a link to one paper that might be relevant. It shows basically if you pre-train on one thing uh, and then train on another thing. Uh, that pre-training task can actually deteriorate performance for later tasks in some settings. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would probably depend quite a bit on the application and what the specific tasks are. So it's difficult to say something general about this, but uh, yeah, it's a really interesting question. Okay, I think we can end there.